with WSP Canada, which is a member of a joint venture partnership called Centris, which is managing all aspects of the project that you see in, going on at Parliament Hill now, which includes, in addition to the archaeology, there's also conservation of Canada's most historic building taking place. Stephen has been a consultant archaeologist since 2009. Uh, in addition to traditional archaeology, Stephen has also worked on oil and gas projects and projects for mining and other industries as well. Uh, he holds a master's degree in heritage conservation from Carleton University, so that makes him a local boy. Uh, so without any further ado, would everyone please welcome project manager for the Centre Block Rehabilitation mm -hmm. Project, Stephen Jarrett. <coughs> Stephen Jarrett. Okay. So Richard, I'm going to now, I'm going to mute everyone. Mute me, yeah. And uh, so if uh, you, you and Stephen could, um, well, actually you probably, because you're both co-hosts, you probably won't need to unmute yourselves, but if you do. No, I'll unmute myself when we get to the question period, if you okay. want to mute, or, or do I mute myself here? No, I, I'm, I'm muting everybody now. Sorry, just bear with me a second here. Just not very familiar with Zoom. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> We're all learning. <clears throat> okay, everyone see uh, just the uh, picture of center block in the background there? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> so uh, many of you may have seen uh, the kind of media coverage that we've had over the last couple of years uh, on our works up on Barland Hill. Um, the span and scope of uh, everything we're doing is uh, so large that I just want to kind of provide a very high level look um, at our work, uh, kind of give you an update on it. Um, the media coverage was kind of spotty in 2018, um, more intense kind of in 2019. And um, with COVID, uh, we've not had obviously any media coverage uh, this year in our work. So uh, just wanted to get take you back to the genesis of everything we're doing. So the Center Block Rehabilitation Project is, uh, as um, you're saying, a very large rehabilitation project. So this has been on the books for Canada for a very long time. Uh, these buildings uh, have you know, been built the East Block and West Block in the 1860s uh, and the new center block in uh, 1920. And they're in need of rehabilitation. Uh, the needs of uh, capital has changed substantially. Uh, technology has changed rapidly. Uh, the building was built during large kind of uh, asbestos and other kind of hazardous substance times. And so these things need to be completely redone essentially at this point. Um, and so, there's been a process since 2002, uh, essentially to move the parliament out of the center block <clears throat> to allow for center block to be redone. Uh, and that's why you've seen West Block through time being changed for us locals, kind of glass dome being placed over it uh, to house parliament in that time. So <clears throat> this is kind of the uh, PSPC uh, look at everything. Um, and uh, so it's a very much a modernization and a making uh, the center block ready for the, the next century. Uh, so as part of that, uh, archeology span needs to be considered uh, It's doing the work. Uh, the scope is so large that a large portion of the soil around the center block is being removed uh, for a variety of things, basal isolation of the building, and all kinds of key infrastructure projects to allow for those modern services. Uh, as part of that, archeology span is a destructible resource. Once it is gone, it's gone, there's no replacing it. <clears throat> and so understanding that it's part of the Environmental Assessment Act, PSPC has been doing work on the archeology. span Now, this is not the first time they've done archeology span on the Hill. Uh, they've been doing archeology span up on Parliament Hill since 1992, uh, when Hugh Dexel did some work for the Queen Elizabeth statue base. Um, and so 
there's been dozens of archaeological projects conducted on Parliament Hill since 1992. They're all very much focused on infrastructure projects completed by PSPC in that time, though. Um, very much scalpel rate right? small projects doing an infrastructure piece here, an infrastructure piece there. Uh, of course, though, when the, the sum total of all that, um, those small projects together has added a good deal of depth and value to understanding of Parliament Hill's history. In 2006, uh, Parks Canada conducted a very, very large uh, detailed back down analysis of both parliamentary and the judicial precincts uh, in preparation for all this kind of work um, in cooperation with PSPC. Uh, and that document still forms the full basis of uh, our understanding of how we do the work and what uh, could be up on Parliament Hill and the judicial precinct. Uh, so the process behind archaeology is, is not really any different from any other um, scientific approach. Uh, we're looking to do background analysis. What can we expect uh, around what we might find and build guidance documents on how we're going to deal with archaeological resources. This project has its own management plan for archaeological resources. Uh, and then once we have an understanding of what we may find, uh, testing and determining. So this process has been ongoing for a long time on Parliament Hill, uh, and we're just kind of at the, uh, the latest point in that process. So the, the very obvious piece um, to be found uh, that most people will be well aware of is both the military history of the Hill and the parliamentary history of the Hill. Uh, both have deep histories um, in Ottawa and is well known. Uh, so what we're looking at now is the military complex in 1850 that was present on Parliament Hill uh, and had a history from 1827 <clears throat> through to now. And so this forms a large chart of what we're looking at, uh, trying to find. So I'm just going to walk everyone through a little bit of the history of the military complex and talk about kind of our finds in relation to it. Uh, very high level, unfortunately, again, the kind of time limit on this presentation means that I don't have time to go in depth on everything, A, of the history and B, of the finds that we've had. Uh, and at this point, we're also still very much in the early part of the process of dealing with this work. We've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of on-site work, and now we need to move into the off-site work. Um, again, we've been still in the field, still uh, doing work in association with this kind of early phase of uh, soil removal up on the hill. So <clears throat> the military complex you just saw was built uh, entirely for the Royal Sappers and Miners Regiment. Uh, as part of the construction of the Rio Canal. Now, the Royal Sappers and Miners is an interesting military uh, company. Uh, they're not your standard soldiers. It's a it was originally called the Military Artificers, uh, and the idea is that these are actually soldiers who are masons and other skilled laborers. Uh, they're not your standard soldiers, your standard laborers. Uh, these are people with skills and they are recruited specifically for their skills into the Royal Sappers and Miners. Uh, now this was born out of uh, having difficulty keeping uh, people with these skills uh, in working and so applying a military discipline to them and raising these companies and having them consistently working uh, was a key aspect of that. And so kind of that was started in Gibraltar actually uh, in the 1770s and it kind of plays through the time and now we're, we're sitting here and we have uh, multiple companies throughout the British military who are doing this work. Uh, so Colonel Bai specifically asked for four companies of Royal Sappers and Miners uh, to be brought to Bytown for uh, the works along the canal. He was very concerned that he was not going to get enough uh, skilled artisans uh, in this kind of remote part of the colonies uh, and needed the skilled laborer to do the work as well. Now he only had received two companies, the 7th and the 15th uh, at that time, and they arrived in Bytown in 1827, a year after Bai arrived himself. Um, they were key in constructing the canal in many ways. Uh, contractors uh, and the contract system failed in a few places, including Hogsback, and uh, needed to shore up a lot of the works with the Royal Sappers and Miners. Uh, even though the contractors did actually manage to acquire uh, many skilled artisans because uh, there was a lot of canal building that was, had been done um, in the dis not to distant area and it, it did draw people from as far as the United States as well. Uh, but they served a whole variety of roles, uh, including policing uh, when needed. 
Uh, now these two companies, when they arrived, there was 160 of them. Um, the seventh was pretty quickly uh, deployed down to the Isthmus, um, again, with the problem there. Um, but uh, the, largely the 15th was stationed here. And of course they moved around considerably um, through time. I thought it'd be interesting to kind of show this here. Uh, this is kind of what happened to uh, those 160 men through time. 35 deserted, which I'll come back to later as well, um, the issue of desertion amongst um, soldiery in uh, the New World. And uh, <clears throat> uh, one was transported away, 16 died, five were killed by blasting rock, one drowned, and 71 were discharged. They took, a lot of them took up land and other took up roles with uh, the continued maintenance of the canal. Uh, and then 31 returned to England through time. Now, post-canal construction, uh, this military complex was entirely built for uh, housing these two companies. Uh, and of course, it didn't actually end up housing both companies through time. They actually built another barracks at the Isthmus. Um, and post-canal, there was a, an idea to build a star fort here. And so this map is actually uh, drawn up by Colonel Bai. Um, as a star fort for this end of the canal. Now the, the cost overrun in the Rideau Canal meant that uh, there wasn't funds to do this. And the kind of by town end of uh, the canal wasn't considered to be at great risk of attack. So uh, through time it was proposed to have more work done on it, but it, because of lack of funds, uh, there was never any really additional fortification done to the Bytown end. Uh, now more fortifications were done at the southern end, Kingston, and a little bit further up the canal from Kingston. Uh, but it's interesting to see what could have been. It would have been a very different um, site when Parliament came if there had been a star fort uh, located there at that time. Despite the fact that the there was no additional fortifications done, uh, there still was um, need to defend this end of the canal. Uh, and Bytown still served as the headquarters for the administration. It served as the headquarters for the construction and it continued to serve as the headquarters for the administration of the canal um, after post-construction. Now, as a result, there was still a need to put some soldiery here. And through time from 1832 to 1844, various detachments were deployed at Bytown, uh, various numbered regiments. And so these numbered regiments had come from England and they sent small detachments um, and it varied through time, depending on which regiment, uh, the challenges of the political situation from 1832 to 1844, including the rebellions, meant the number of soldiers increased, decreased. There was a regiment of militia drawn for uh, during the rebellion. Uh, and we had only three soldiers for a short period of time uh, stationed on the site, just kind of as a maintenance force as well in that time. Uh, <clears throat> this kind of was a very transient piece. Uh, these, these regiments uh, pulled out every two years, two to three years in large part. And there was other mentions of soldiers wintering over here. So as the regiments were moving east to west um, and coming through the canal, some of them would end up wintering here uh, at Bytown. Uh, <clears throat> so we get kind of an evolution of the understanding of how the British military wanted to deal with Canada and the challenges of dealing with uh, uh, putting soldiers in Canada. Uh, there was a need for military presence here, but the cost was high and issue of desertion was huge. Um, 5,000 soldiers deserted to the Americans uh, in this kind of early period um, from Montreal. And so this was a huge issue of, of men going to the United States. Uh, one of these issues led to the result of the Royal Canadian Rifles Regiment being generated. Um, and it was stationed from Bytown from 1844 to 1853 with varied numbers between 46 and 83 soldiers. Now, this was an interesting regiment in that um, to combat it, they would required 15 years service in the British Army prior to join, uh, but your pay was doubled and there was a higher allotment of wives per men. So uh, as part of the work, <clears throat> six or seven uh, wives per 100 soldiers were allowed to uh, be accommodated and receive rations and basically have a job um, cooking and cleaning and, and dealing with all the things uh, in the uh, barracks. 
And so they had a higher allotment, um, currently Canadian Rifles Regiment of 12 to uh, kind of assist with that. So there was a few pieces to, to help uh, these, the 15 year minimum service also meant these were older men. Uh, and they also allowed them to, to take up other work. Um, so they didn't have to spend their entire time in the garrison and uh, they could actually do other jobs as well. So there was quite a few perks for being in the Canadian Rifles Regiment. Uh, and of course, again, Bytown evolved greatly through this period. Uh, but this is, again, this kind of large chunk of time. This is the, the largest chunk of time we have of um, the military presence in Ottawa with a very substantial number um, of people at this time. Uh, and again, further evolution of that uh, British thoughts about how to do it, the cost of having all this kind of stuff. Um, the rifles were withdrawn. They weren't uh, disbanded. There was there was Canadian rifles continued, but from Ottawa disbanded. And a lot of these posts ended up having um, pensioner scheme uh, implemented on them. So the idea was to provide ordnance land, so military land uh, that had been set aside for military purposes, uh, given up to pensioners so that they could have uh, land nearby to these posts and they could serve as a, a force for these posts. Um, it was kind of a way of already having pensioners and provide a cheaper way of kind of staffing some of these outposts. Um, initially 150 pensioners um, were kind of stationed here but uh, this number seems to have waned a little bit through time. Um, many of them ended up being accommodated at the post though unfortunately because there wasn't enough land available and this was a common problem with a lot of these things. Uh, and this kind of scheme ended in 1858 uh, giving way to the construction of the Parliament buildings in uh, 1859. So uh, we have a military post here. Uh, it wasn't, we can't call it a fort. It wasn't, uh, you know, fortified in any kind of uh, substantial way to our knowledge. Uh, but it was an outpost and it wasn't an insignificant outpost either. It did have a fairly substantial military presence and it played a very important role in early Bytown. Uh, provisions and other abilities to, for, uh, you know, not replacing the construction of the canal, um, and the resource required for that, but it created a constant need for this. And the officers and other stuff created a, you know, aristocracy uh, and alertedness to uh, early by town. Uh, that's not necessarily available when you don't have the military around. But uh, what we have here now is what do we learn from the excavation? We have this understanding of the basic history of uh, the military here. Uh, what do we learn from archeology? span So I just wanna kind of briefly highlight kind of our finds and uh, discuss how those briefly play into the history. So <clears throat> you can see in the background behind, this is us excavating uh, the guardhouse. This is kind of early days in, in the excavation of the guardhouse, um, which is one of the pieces of the main uh, coverage of the media. But uh, so these are the six kind of pillars of what we found. Six privies uh, found in multiplications across the military complex. Uh, privies are really interesting finds uh, for us. Uh, they provide a little bit of a time capsule. Uh, so you actually deposit your waste uh, both from your body and from other things in the privies. And it gives us a little bit of a snippet of time. Now privies get cleaned out, they get moved, uh, but through time, you get a very nice sealed piece of uh, archaeology in there. Now, when you drop a plate on the ground in kind of a normal area, it gets walked on substantially and it gets broken up in little tiny pieces. Um, in a privy, you drop it in and it doesn't get walked on anymore. It's already broken, but it's only maybe broken in four or five pieces. Um, and so the preservation of the materials in a privy is, is high. You also get preservation of uh, seeds and other things that people are consuming and uh, releasing. Uh, you get leathers and other kind of claws surviving much better in these privy contexts. And so they're very interesting snippets. Uh, the six privies we found, uh, most of them are kind of later privies. Um, 
and then only a couple of them are, are earlier privies. Uh, but they do provide us very fascinating snippets of time that we can look at and see what was available to the soldiery uh, in a very short period of time, uh, rather than kind of in the general site where we know basically from 1827 to 1858, uh, anything could have been dropped. Uh, the cookhouse. So the cookhouse was uh, constructed by Colonel By apparently uh, after the construction of the barracks, looking to house the women and children. So uh, it was an interesting find getting the cookhouse partially intact. Unfortunately, uh, both the cookhouse and the barracks are kind of in the north end of the site. And the way the preservation worked, uh, they basically landscaped uh, after the construction of the building down to a specific grade. They wanted to make it very flat. And the barracks and the cookhouse are just kind of on the upward trend of the slope. And so we lose kind of the north end of the cookhouse and uh, a lot of the occupation surface for the eastern barrack and the occupation surface between the cookhouse and the barrack. Um, so we don't have a huge amount of information kind of on the north end. We do have some interesting structural remains for the cookhouse um, and some pits and stuff just to the south of it that are quite interesting and that we need to do some more work now analyzing to understand better. So you know which the Eastern Barrack uh, is the next kind of pillar. Uh, <clears throat> basically, the, we only had about a third of the barrack surviving, again, because of this preservation where they were landscaping down and the bedrock was uh, much higher at that end of uh, the hill. Uh, but this was the barrack that was actually used most extensively by the military. The center and the west barrack were both burned down at various times. The center one seemed to have been reused quite a few times for various purposes, uh, but this one seemed to have been used as a barrack for the entire period of use on the hill. So it was quite an interesting uh, barrack that it's the one that survived. Now the guardhouse survived wonderfully. Um, we have more, about a meter height um, plus in areas surviving of the guardhouse. Uh, and this would have been the basement area. So we have the surface of the basement surviving in the entirety of the guardhouse, um, as long with the demolition. So they seem to knock the building largely in on itself. Quite interestingly, a lot of pieces uh, that were you know, hammered up on the walls uh, survived in that as well. Bell pulls um, and other things. Um, tags for the various rooms. So it's quite an interesting piece. This is the entrance to the military complex. Uh, it is the first three jail cells in Ottawa. Um, and immediately after the construction of the canal, the hospital on the, that had been initially built for the workers and the military people during the construction uh, was too large for the post uh, construction need. And so the guardhouse, the second story, the guardhouse was actually adapted into uh, the hospital for the military complex uh, and the former hospital turned into officer's quarters. Uh, so this <clears throat> was a key entrance point and it would have been the, you know, the only thing you saw when you first came in. Uh, and so a very, very uh, important part of the site and uh, it survived quite incredibly. In fact, uh, the parliamentary, the first parliament destroyed the construction of the uh, Garth Tunnel, which I'll talk about later again, uh, actually did the most damage to this structure um, rather than anything modern. Uh, powder magazine. So there's a separate structure to protect powder um, and the people from the powder. So you need to store it in barrels and you don't want uh, it exploding and uh, accidentally exploding and, and damaging your other structures. It's kind of kept a little bit further away and it was kind of close to the guardhouse again for it to be guarded um, at all times as well. Uh, and then the well, the well, this is the second well that w worked on the hill. They water in Upper Bytown and on the hill was a challenge all through this time. And so uh, this was the second well sunk and they ended up blasting in a very, very large hole in the bedrock, 7.1 meters deep. Um, there's a wood platform on the top. Uh, so they really, really needed the water. Uh, you can imagine the amount of effort um, when they basically gave up doing a well during the Royal Sappers and Miners time and actually had a you know, detachment of guys just on water duty, bring water up to uh, the Barrack Hill uh, every day. And you can imagine 70 to 100 
guys and, and gals needing a lot of water uh, plus horses uh, on a daily basis. And so uh, having to truck it up from the river was quite challenging on a daily basis. So this well uh, represented a significant investment of time and energy uh, in order to get water and make that job much easier. Uh, so there's a lot of details, a lot of granularity in what we learn from these various structures uh, that we don't know just from the historical sources. Um, one of the biggest things is changes. Uh, so we kind of have some good descriptions kind of early by town uh, with the Royal Cypress Myers construction of the hill. Um, after that, it gets a little less uh, detailed on the the daily life on the hill. This is a survey plan. Um, as you can see, it's not dated, but it has the center block uh, footprint on it. Uh, and it also has a footprint of the various uh, military buildings that weren't directly underneath. Now, some of these were definitely reused during the construction as offices and other spaces, um, at least for a short period of time. And uh, this kind of shows what survives. And <clears throat> we can say, see quite a bit of change in the mapping over time, not massive change, right? We still have the three barracks, we still have the same guardhouse uh, through time, but a lot of little changes, changes to the guardhouse, changes to the cookhouse, uh, movement of the privies around as we've seen by the number of privies that we found um, that are quite fascinating for understanding things through, through time. Um, the biggest structural change uh, that I'm gonna highlight to you um, since of the limited time is, uh, in the guardhouse. So we have this drawing here on the right of uh, the guardhouse and or in, the, in this says guard room and hospital. Um, and this shows the two story structure with a seven foot basement uh, with the hospital functions on the second floor uh, and kind of a separated piece in the large room on the first floor with stairs going up onto the, the second floor for the hospital with the jail cells in the back. Uh, so this is dated 1852. Uh, and as we saw in the previous survey plan, there's a nice little extension um, shown uh, on that survey plan. And we have uh, found that extension obviously in, uh, in real life. And so <clears throat> this extension, what was it for? Uh, you know, the sources don't really give us any information, but it's also very interesting seeing this kind of post uh, pensioner kind of building phase. So we actually have a number of structures uh, and changes to structure in the pensioner phase, uh, which shows kind of a, a very large uh, need for the site to change in that kind of very late period. Um, and so this appears to have been hospital related. It's coming out of the hospital side of the back of the guardhouse. And in fact, the kind of area right in front of us uh, in the picture is a privy, uh, which we found no military paraphernalia in actually. Um, so it was quite interesting and it's dates very end to the very late period of the site confirming the, the date uh, associated with the, the drawing. So these structural changes are very interesting to, to see the needs change and the kind of different phases of use uh, and understanding uh, how the military used the site through time. Uh, other things that uh, you don't get to see on these maps and plans are drains. Um, now we found a number of drains. Uh, on the left is a very formal limestone box drain, uh, which went to both the barrack and the cookhouse. Uh, again, quite the, the implementation for drainage on the site. On the right side, we have this circular uh, box drain that's not quite as formal as the one on the left, which actually surrounded a pit, um, which would have kept it nice and dry through time. Now. The interesting part about these two is the sequencing that we can see. So this drain went out of use uh, in time and the pit was filled in at one point. And then we have a privy cutting through the pit on the back side, uh, And we have another privy cutting through the, the, the drain on the front side uh, and it allows us to help us sequence it all. Um, when they filled in the pit too, they also laid a layer of sand down on this entire area of the site. And so that caps it. So we can see the artifacts in the various layers and see uh, the time prior to this sand, and we'll be able to date the, based on the artifacts that we find uh, the various layers of occupation. You only have a you know 30 year period really that this uh, the site's used, uh, but at the same time we actually have quite a few changes. We can see those changes uh, by the stratigraphy on the site. 
Uh, pits and postal. So <clears throat> again, there's so many temporary things that you don't see on these permanent plans. This is the, the pit, it's a very large square pit uh, that you saw that drain going around, the circular drain. Uh, and <clears throat> we have remnants of a wood floor uh, just on top of the bedrock. Uh, so this was uh, filled in with sand and there's not actually a lot of stuff found. It must've been cleaned out just prior to filling it. So uh, very interesting to see, do some research on what uh, this pit might've been, but it clearly was meant to be dry space uh, to be used for some kind of storage. Uh, but again, no indication of this uh, from any of the sources, obviously, or the mapping. And of course the artifacts themselves uh, tell a story. I could fill an entire presentation with artifacts. Um, I know that would be uh, lovely to see, uh, but I've just kind of done this one slide here um, showing a large amount of stuff um, for you, you know, just to talk through a few pieces. Uh, one coinage is really interesting. We have coinage from Ireland, uh, Spain, France, England, uh, and shows the kind of international scope and reach of the military these, these soldiers would have served uh, in various places all over the world and uh, the coinage kind of followed through with them. Uh, we have hundreds of pieces of coin. Uh, as you can see, as we pull them out of the ground, they're not always the cleanest. Uh, we can't always identify them as much as we might um, make a quick scrub at them at first. Uh, but uh, we look forward to kind of identifying all these coins uh, and seeing where they come in the world and it shows the scope. Again, early coins, we have coins from uh, the 1780s even uh, being found on the site. So it shows the scope of the use of these coins as well. Uh, smoking pipes are one of the most common finds. Uh, smoking was very prolific at the time. Um, and so you find these clay pipes all over the place. Bottles, this is uh, from Privy, again, lovely intact bottles, and we'll be able to date what kind of things. Some of them are generic. Some of the bottles can be filled with a whole variety of things. Other ones are very much uh, labeled uh, or have very specific use based on their shape and size. And so we can be able to see what kind of things are being used through time uh, on the site as well, uh, along with all the ceramics and the wonderful things uh, that you find uh, on the site. So again, as we go through that process of identifying and cleaning everything and uh, cataloging everything by where it is, it allows us to date layers and allows us to date and understand what parts of the site were used for what through time. Uh, the big part of this that was kind of fascinating uh, was the survival. Um, basically, no one really thought that uh, a lot of this stuff would survive um, and it survived uh, incredibly well in most parts. Um, the, the depth of the fill on the south end of the site uh, was incredible. Uh, we have anywhere from a meter to three meters of fill over top of the military layers. So uh, again, when we get to the barracks, basically they had cut down the grade uh, at that end of the site. And as you go further south, they had filled up um, during the construction with the soil from the footprint of the building uh, to create that level ground surface, that flat landscape afterwards. Uh, and through time that's preserved it, all the kind of modern, small modern utilities kind of gone through the top part. And we have very few deeper modern utilities that have cut down into the military structures uh, through time. So uh, it's this fill layer has uh, come to save this military aspect of the site for us uh, to discover during this. So the second aspect of the site of course is parliament. And uh, so <clears throat> there's quite a bit of history obviously to Ottawa becoming, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time here. I'll try and speed up the uh, next part here. Um, but yeah, the, the story of Ottawa becoming parliament is uh, long, uh, basically uh, the United Provinces rather than uh, the country of Canada uh, from 1841 uh, had a rotating parliament uh, in various places, Kingston, Quebec City, Montreal, and Toronto. Um, and it was hard for them to agree on location. Um, the Queen was asked several times for clarity on it. Um, Ottawa was considered the best kind of second choice. Uh, it wasn't any of those four places. Um, it was in the middle, but it also was the same reason for the canal being here. Uh, it was more defensible, it was further away from the United States and so not so easy to just come across the border and attack. 
Uh, so all those features came in for Ottawa being chosen um, as the seat of government. So at this time, very much they were interested in constructing an icon. Um, it wasn't just about housing parliament. Uh, you can do that anywhere. Um, they were very much in the interest of nation building and creating something visionary uh, for generations to come, uh, which they succeeded in doing. Um, a lot of this was very much based on the British Parliament, which has been redone um, within 10 years. Um, and so construction began in, in 1859, December 1859, with removal of some of the military buildings. Um, and just in the background here, you can see a, a photo of the construction. You can just see the guardhouse peeking out over some wood piles. It's hard to tell, um, even without the uh, purple background here. Um, but uh, for the archaeology, the, the learning of what we can add to the story of Parliament, I'm not going to go into detail again because uh, I think Parliament's, the history of Parliament's fairly well known by most, uh, but archaeology can still teach us uh, things about uh, the construction. Now, one of the major issues with the first construction was the depth of bedrock and the hardness of the bedrock. Um, and so the heating and ventilation system is one of the most interesting uh, pieces of that. And so on the screen now you can see a plan of uh, the, the site. And you can see the smaller sizes, you won't uh, recognize the shapes of the east block and west block. Um, again, as Parliament uh, grew as we added provinces, the, the needs of these buildings continued to grow um, and grow and grow. And immediately after they finished these buildings, they were already adding extensions uh, to these buildings through time. But you can see these kind of, uh, all these kind of paths coming out from the buildings. And this is the early heating and ventilation system. Uh, it's most certainly the largest subsurface piece that you'll find uh, and a very interesting part of the story because it was a large part of those cost overruns. Uh, the need to drop the heating system down into the bedrock uh, and the need to create these ventilation tunnels. So I have a photo. This one is not your standard uh, ventilation tunnel up on Parliament Hill. This is the reverse of your standard uh, ventilation tunnel. Most of them are cut down at the bedrock. This is one little tiny pocket uh, just to the east of the Peace Tower where you actually have three meters plus of uh, soil before you hit the bedrock, just kind of a little dip in the bedrock here. Um, and they actually had to build up. And so you can see the size, this is uh, 3.2 meters tall just to the right, uh, getting progressively uh, you know, shorter as you go along, but you can see our measuring sticks, our uh, range rods here are a meter. So the size of this uh, structure is, is immense. Uh, so the, the Garth ventilation tunnels were designed by a man called Charles Garth from Montreal. And it's not designed in isolation. Uh, these kind of ventilation tunnels were early industrial heating. So big buildings back prior to this steam age of technology required you to have a ton of fireplaces essentially to heat uh, and you needed fresh air as well so you needed to open a window in the winter to get fresh air uh, from the fire and you needed the fire to have your heat it wasn't ideal um, and so they were already experimenting with uh, heating and ventilation systems with steam technology uh, again there was a early genesis of this in the British Parliament as well. It was actually generated by doctors who were looking to create healthier environments um, for people. Um, the stale uh, sooty air inside these buildings was not safe. It was also a logistical challenge. If you have a million fireplaces, uh, you need to get supplies to a million fireplaces. Uh, so you're running all the supplies through the building constantly trying to keep those fire going, to keep the building warm. And so these early uh, heating designs were an attempt uh, to create heat for the entire building in an industrial scale. Uh, so the designer of the center block uh, decided that this ventilation tunnel system was actually the best. And it was based off of a number of systems uh, around the world. Now, unfortunately, the Garth ventilation system did not work very well. There was immediately complaints of stale air and um, cold air coming from the system. Uh, and it was not ideal in any way. Now, of course, unfortunately, the 
construction of the building was stopped uh, at one point because of the cost overruns and part of that was the depth of bedrock. So we can see some changes actually in the physical form. Um, they negotiated through time actually you know, increasing the scale of these tunnels uh, and re reducing the smoothness of the tunnels. Uh, one of the problems with moving air, uh, especially fresh air in cold temperatures, is that ice will build up on rough surfaces quicker than it will on smooth. Um, and so there was a concern that these tunnels would actually uh, come in. So you can see the smoothness of the tunnels was key for moving the air through. Uh, but in this case, this is a very interesting spot actually to the west of the Peace Tower. Um, and we have this bedrock cut that comes out of the building and comes, 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 and then stops right here. And you can see, uh, you know, this wall of bedrock underneath this lip in the tunnel. Uh, and they just simply stopped excavating bedrock suddenly. Uh, the tunnel shoots up in scale, which is supposed to be perfectly level. Uh, and they actually narrow the tunnel substantially here. Uh, and you know, who knows, this might've been one of the pieces of the pause um, in the ventilation tunnel creation uh, and you know, the, the renegotiation of what you're gonna do. But of course, you know, the, was the design the issue? Now, obviously it's the forefront of design. Um, you know, it hadn't been necessarily tested in the Canadian climate and in the Canadian weather, but also uh, these compromises they made to the system immediately uh, likely also played an effect. So we can actually see the size of all these tunnels. We can compare them all to the design and we can give some understanding of what changed between the early design and what was actually constructed uh, to give it a better understanding. Uh, but we'll, that's still up for debate on uh, whether the design was a problem or whether the compromises were, or, or maybe a bit of both. Now, the other big change um, that we can see in the landscape was actually the landscape plan that was implemented for the hill. So when the parliament buildings were done, there was actually no landscape plan. Um, in part funds, in part just uh, you know the need to get on with the business of parliament and the new construction that they were doing. Um, but they did move on to having a landscape plan drawn uh, and completed by 1875 in large part. And so you see here the center block there and the east block inside and the, the box walls um, designed by Vox, uh, who was a designer of New Central Park in New York. Um, he never actually visited the site, but um, he sent design plans to the Seton, who was the architect at the time, who implemented a plan in keeping with that. Um, now, a huge part of this is unchanged today. Um, it is changed in small parts. Um, one of the major changes uh, that we can see through time is actually this fountain to the right here. You can see just at the base of the stairs, this very large fountain um, implemented there. Now, this, this fountain was put in by Seton, but uh, Fuller actually became the Dominion architect um, in 1882 and uh, he didn't like the fountain. Uh, it conflicted with his perception of the design for the center block uh, and he had it removed. There was some talk about moving it to the other side of the west block, but uh, that never happened. Uh, and instead, we just have it removed from the landscape. Um, so you can see us here, it actually survived um, quite nicely. They just removed kind of the top layers of it and uh, the actual structure survives quite nicely underneath. Um, in large part. So as part of that landscape design, there was also diagonal paths um, going from the fountain to the corners of the lawn. Um, and you can just see, uh, if you look to the kind of upper right of the screen, this kind of darker patch coming from the fountain to that corner of the lawn um, where those paths were. And you can actually see that all through the aerial photography um, in the 20th century. And so we actually found drains associated with all of those things to drain the path and keep it uh, in better condition through time. So that landscape uh, survived uh, underneath the landscape. Now, it's interesting, is, is this a landscape error? The listening to the architects today, um, there's a design philosophy kind of to come through the central part of the gates of the building all the way back through the library. Um, you're supposed to be able to kind of walk straight through. Now, obviously with security concerns today, um, that's not possible, uh, but certainly this fountain would have gotten in the way of that. 
Uh, now, of course, we do have the Centennial Flame um, at the south end, much, much smaller. Uh, you can kind of see it on the right side here, the, the fountain in the foreground and then the Centennial Flame in the background there. So it, it doesn't break it up the same way that this, uh, this fountain would have. Uh, but it's an interesting part of the history of the site that uh, you have these conflicting visions over uh, what use this public space. Now, of course, uh, these stairs are now used for all range of uh, both public uh, candidate events and, and variety of things, uh, but also protests. And so uh, they've actually done some landscape studies seeing that uh, this was is kind of the most used part of the space is there's this natural platform of the stairs. So actually this, this fountain would have gotten in the way of a lot of that, uh, that mingling. So, uh, but we can leave it up for, uh, everyone's opinion on whether or not it was uh, a landscape error or not. Uh, <clears throat> now, of course, in uh, February 3rd, 1916, we had the natural tragedy of the center block uh, burning down. Now, the new center block is kind of built directly on the footprint of the old one. In fact, they reused uh, a portion of the foundation of the, this center block uh, in the new center block. So uh, they're very closely mirrored. There was definitely an attempt to uh, keep them very similar, but we do actually have <clears throat> some surviving remains. Um, so the, the tower before the Peace Tower was actually called the Victoria Tower, um, it was about half the height. Um, but the, the new Peace Tower is actually built on four concrete columns. Uh, and the challenges of building uh, back in the day before you have giant machines that can just uh, rip pretty much anything out of the ground. Um, these kind of large limestone foundations for the first tower have managed to survive in between all those concrete pillars and actually the ventilation tunnel that kind of centrally came through uh, also survives. You can see it coming down underneath the Peace Tower. Um, and so they're actually looking to, uh, they need to do some work on the foundation for the Peace Tower. And so they will need to remove this and we'll be doing further work recording uh, the interior part as well. But it's interesting again that uh, this has all survived so nicely uh, inside that soil matrix. They really only dug what they needed to dig and um, that's the normal kind of axiom at the time. If you don't need to dig more than you have to, uh, you don't. And so it, uh, it's wonderful for us archaeologists that was the method because it allows uh, all those soils and structures to survive. Uh, so it's an interesting little part of the story. Um, and there's, if you can see, it, it's hard to see, but in the bottom left, there's actually the connection between the Victoria Tower and, and the center, original center block was a little wider. So we have a little, little bit of walls as well. And the same thing in the back, the library uh, connection is narrower now than it was uh, in the original, so we got the, the library connections on the back side of the building. So little pieces of uh, the original center block along with uh, the reused foundation. Uh, and so they add little bits of our understanding to uh, the original center block. So I'm gonna stop there and, um, and thank uh, everyone for listening to me talk for almost an hour on this. Uh, most notably too, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone who uh, has been involved. This uh, is not just a, a Steve Jarrett thing. This is a, an entirely team approach. There's uh, multiple different levels of uh, pieces, including my archeology span team uh, who endured uh, all kinds of conditions, uh, rain, snow and shine um, to deal with uh, doing the archeology, span um, the constructor uh, and the client who, uh, manage and help us coordinate all the work uh, and keep us going through it all. So thank you. Well, thank you. So, sorry about that, Stephen. Thank you for uh, your talk. I always feel kind of bad at this point because normally this would be the point when you would hear applause from uh, everyone uh, <laughs> thanking you for a great presentation. Unfortunately, with the technology, you get nothing but that terrible silence at the end of your presentation. But I certainly enjoyed it. And we've got a few questions for you. Have you got a few minutes to... Uh, uh, actually, I see one that just popped up right now by David says, when will people be uh, allowed onto the site? Uh, onto the center block site? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have an understanding of the exact time scale of uh, all the works that are be done in center block, but of course it's a controlled site um, and it's a construction site. So there was some uh, 
in last year, we had some archaeology, public archaeology days where you could actually come and see um, the foundation here. They were they were done kind of pretty quickly, um, but we did have over 1,200 people um, come visit uh, the site at that time. But uh, yeah. nowadays, it is, is deep day, in the construction site. Yeah, I attended that day. That was quite nice. Uh, yeah, that one just popped up. Uh, so here's a few questions, just uh, four, uh, if you can answer them for us. Someone suggested, I guess for the future, uh, could you provide a drone's eye view of the exact location of the buildings discovered on the hill, uh, showing in relation to the present buildings and statues? Yeah, so uh, as part of all our work, we'll be doing uh, extensive reporting on all the, the finds, including detailed mapping. Um, all these things have been 3D laser scanned and drawn to scale, uh, photographed extensively, um, photogrammetry as well. So we have detailed scopes of that, and we will be producing a report for PSPC um, with all that, which I imagine will be uh, made available to the public uh, in the future. Okay, and that kind of follows up with a question here that someone asked, is there a plan to have an exhibitor display somewhere about the results of the archaeological work? Yes, so actually we were um, looking at a few options um, prior to COVID, um, and like most things that uh, has put a damper on a lot of things, but yes, the PSPC uh, is most certainly looking to um, do something with the collection here and uh, No. Did we lose you? Did I lose you? No, it looks like I just got uh, oh. muted. Yeah, hang on. I think that was my fault. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's certainly not yeah. intentional, Stephen. No worries. <laughs> Is anyone hearing my question? Because I think I got lost somewhere along the way here too. Am I still on? Yes, yeah, can you are, you. Richard. Okay. Can, you repeat, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, I just want to make sure you hear my questions here. I just went blank for a minute. Uh, someone asks here, uh, what about security? What do you do overnight to protect the site from amateur archaeologists looking for something valuable? Yeah, so this was uh, obviously being Parliament Hill is uh, was always uh, having the high level of security. Um, there's the PSPC uh, PPS security service on the hill, uh, along with uh, the construction it has its own uh, commissioners and everything. So it's uh, it's got extensive security. Uh, no one's allowed on site without uh, a certain level of clearance and a, uh, a badge for the construction site. So, okay, uh, you mentioned a hospital at one point. Would there have been nurses or other women at Barrack Hill? Yeah, so the wives um, of the soldiers, uh, there would have been a certain number of wives, um, apparently 40 initially, but again, that number would have changed uh, through time. Uh, I don't know of nurses per se. Um, there was definitely, we mentioned a, a doctor, uh, I'm sure he had assistance, and I'm sure uh, through time they might have also had the wives doing various duties. Uh, at the time, those kind of uh, roles would have been very malleable, but uh, I don't know of a formal nurse uh, at this time. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions here. I, some were just coming in here. Uh, what happened <clears throat> to the actual fountain in the middle of the lawn? Does it still exist anywhere? Uh, so that fountain is actually part of the uh, Parliamentary Welcome Center area. So it was removed uh, in part of the construction works. Um, on the site. Okay, and here's a good question that uh, we should ask. Any evidence of Indigenous presence on the site? So uh, we did find uh, Indigenous peace uh, during our work. Um, PSPC has uh, reached out to the Algonquins and has asked me to not uh, discuss the find at this time okay. in respect for the consultation process. Oh, okay. And one last question here, which I thought would be a nice one to end on. Uh, someone asked, what inspired you to become an archaeologist? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to blame my dad on that one. Uh, okay. Because of uh, the deep love of history, uh, he imbued with me um, over time. Uh, and so when I was going off to university, um, most certainly 
uh, had a passion for history, uh, but a more physical aspect to it, not just uh, a book learning, but uh, a physical uh, part of it. So archaeology kind of fit that nicely, providing a, a physical uh, outlet along with a, an interest in history at the same time. So that's what kind of pushed me towards archaeology. So you have to admit you have fun doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you need to you need to have fun doing this, or else uh, you'll be uh, crushed through uh, the time. And one last question that I, that I wanted to ask, uh, not that I'm impatient or anything, uh, how long will this process uh, be going on? So uh, again, we're still in the field doing various things like the Victoria Tower and whatnot, uh, and so. COVID has also affected our ability to do work, so it slowed down the process. Uh, but certainly in the next year or so, um, these things should be much more available. Okay, well, thank you, Steve. And that's our questions. And again, I wish you could hear some applause from everyone, but I certainly enjoyed it. And I do want to finish with this. One of our listeners, Sarah Clark, just uh, chatted to everyone. I definitely could have listened for at least an hour more. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe that's a nice way to end. So thank you, Stephen, for being our guest speaker tonight and best of luck with the rest of the project. And uh, since we have no more questions, I guess I'll just wrap things up and thank everyone for joining our meeting tonight. And uh, I should check and see when our, oops, when our next meeting is. Let me do that now. Should get on our website. Uh, I should have done this ahead of time. Excuse uh -oh. me, uh, Richard, may I uh, add something sure. please? Yes, absolutely. Um, there were a number of people who were not able to uh, to join the meeting this evening. Uh, there was a cutoff in terms of the numbers we were allowed to admit, although we, we thought we had extended that number. Anyway, I would just like to add, if, if people are talking to their friends within the society or their friends, this lecture will be available on the website within the next couple of weeks. So you will, you will be able to see it again, or uh, for people who, had, who missed the lecture, uh, it will be available. That's good. And yeah, just to finish off then, our, our guest speaker uh, for December the 2nd will be uh, HSO's very own Randy Boswell, who will be talking about Kettle Island, a bridge to Ottawa's past. So that will be 7 p.m. December 2nd. So I hope you'll join us then. Until then, thank you everyone and have a good evening. Thank you very much.